Some of you will know Jen Gomel, who works on our staff. And if you know her at all, like I do, you know that she is the sweetest, most joyful person. She tells you you don't really know what's in somebody's life or in their past or what they've been through. And I just really appreciate her willingness and courage to share that story, even a little glimpse of it. And if you want to hear more about that, it will be on our website, the longer version. But just how that little girl felt the presence of God when she needed it most, which is at the heart of our series, With God With Us, Experiencing the Meaning of Emmanuel. I'm sure you've had experiences like I have where just being with certain people encourages you, makes you feel better about yourself safer, more secure. Uh, I've told this story before, or I've told some of you that I've had this experience where I've been to uh, Louisiana State Penitentiary, nicknamed Angola, the largest maximum security uh, prison in our country. Over 6,000 inmates, over 18,000 acres. It's larger than Long Island. There are actually six different camps, uh, 1,000 each, inmates each in this prison, and it's uh, on an oxbow of the Mississippi River in the middle, so it's surrounded by barbed wire, of course, and razor wire and guards, but also by snakes and alligators and the swamp. You just really can't get out of that place. And it's the, uh, for many years, it was the bloodiest prison in America. But when Warren Burl Cain came, he brought what he called moral reformation, which was essentially the gospel uh, through Bible college, into the prison system, and it radically changed over the course of a decade that prison from being the bloodiest to one of the safest. However, it's still a scary place to go, a maximum security penitentiary all the way down in Louisiana. When I went there, I remember vividly walking in to the guest house, and that was fine, to the warden's office and the chaplain's office, and that was fine, and then driving around in the vehicles to see in the different camps, and that was fine. But it was a whole different feeling when I went into the largest camp, which held death row inmates, and behind the, when the door shuts behind you, and you're inside the razor wire. But I was with Burl Kane, who is one part Buford Pusser and one part Billy Graham. He's just, he just, he just makes you feel good to be with him. I was with the chaplain, Chaplain Tony, who's passed on, is with our Lord now, and with a man named Ron Hicks, who's an inmate pastor doing life without possibility of parole, one of the godliest, humblest pastors I know. Those three men, I walked in with them, and I, I would have been terrified without them, but with them, I just felt, I felt safe, I felt secure, I felt totally calm and excited to be there. Another story about being with somebody. When I, uh, some of you will know that my favorite author is, um, you know, outside the author of the Bible, of course, is C.S. Lewis. And I got invited to go to a C.S. Lewis conference uh, a number of years ago. Uh, and I not, not only, I could have attended for, you know, and paid to go, but I got invited to go for free as the guest of Jerry Root, who was a C.S. Lewis professor and presenting a paper there. And I got to go to a special dinner with a man named Walter Hooper. Now, some of you don't know or care, but I was pretty excited about Walter Hooper. Walter Hooper is the, authorized, the author of the authorized biography of Lewis's life. He was his personal secretary for the last decade of his life. So this was like, oh, you know, got to sit with him at dinner and listen to his personal stories about his life with C.S. Lewis. And then the next day at the conference, I got Jerry and Walter invited me to come sit with them in like the speaker's area, you know. I wasn't anybody. I don't, haven't written anything. I'm not a scholar, but I felt so cool just walking in with Walter. Walter pulls up. He's like this big, like a hobbit. <laughs> me and Walter walking in to the, the conference together. There are people in your life in the certain circumstances who just being with them makes you feel better about yourself. Makes you feel more secure, more comfortable, calmer. And you have those people in your life when you're a little kid. Maybe it's grandpa's lap or... Maybe it's the presence of your parents or a good friend. Our series, With, Experiencing the Meaning of Emmanuel, is about what is, it, what is it really like that God is with us? What does that mean? What does that do in our lives? What does it produce? Last week, we looked at the promise of Emmanuel. How the promise that God would, would come to his people was not only the fulfillment of prophecies in the Old Testament, which it certainly was, Isaiah written 733 years, Isaiah 714, before Christ was born. But it was also the fulfillment of even an even older longing and hunger of the human heart. The hunger for God to be with us. Ethelbert Stauffer wrote, it's a very unfortunate name, but it's a good book he wrote called Christ and the Caesars. He said, one of the oldest and earliest longings in the human heart is the longing for God to appear on earth. That the promise of Emmanuel is something that we hunger for, even if we don't name it that way. The story of the Bible is essentially the story of us losing the the promise, uh, the presence, excuse me, of God in the garden by our sin and our attempt to regain it, the Tower of Babel, and then God bringing it back through covenant with Abraham, through the giving of his law, and ultimately in himself, in his son, 
who makes it possible for us to be with the Father again. We see this ultimately consummated in Revelation 21, verse 3, right at the end of the story of the Bible. He, the dwelling of God is with men. He will be their God and they'll be with him. So today I want to look at the presence of Emmanuel. How do we experience God with us in the here and now? We know what's coming someday, but what does Emmanuel mean for us every day? How do we relate to him as a God with us, not a God far off or distant from us? If you have your Bible, open to Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. This will be very familiar to many of you. Even if you're not a Bible scholar, you've watched the Peanuts Charlie Brown Christmas special, and you'll recognize this because Linus reads this every year for us. Luke 2, verses 8 through 20. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste. And found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. We'll stop there. Now, as I said, it's a very familiar passage. Perhaps less familiar is an aspect of the story that it's the first people to hear the good news, the first of those to hear the gospel, to see the gospel, Christ, other than the parents, Mary and Joseph, and to worship Christ and to share or witness the gospel were who? Shepherds. Have you, have you ever stopped to consider why that is? You see an image here of shepherds at night. This, I'm wondering what that's like. They're out there every night watching their flocks. This was not unusual when Luke says, now it happened, there were shepherds in the fields nearby. People would be going, that's unusual. They're always out in the fields nearby watching their flocks. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, why shepherds? It was not an accident. Why were, why were shepherds the first to hear the news? God could have chosen anyone. I mean, let's be honest, shepherds are sort of like the, they're, they're sort of marginalized. Even in the nativity scenes or nativity plays, right, the shepherd is where you put the kids who can't really do much. You know, just stand there. Like, like uh, Mary and Joseph, those are key roles. Baby Jesus, that's pretty awesome. Even the wise men who weren't actually there, we, we, they come about a year later, but we put them there for fun. They're mysterious and exotic from the east. They carry gifts. They even have names, at least in legend. The shepherds are just one step above the cattle or the sheep. You know, just put a sheet over the kid's head, give them a staff, don't say anything, just stand right there, right? <laughs> they're silent, they're nameless. Why are the shepherds the first to hear? Interesting note, if you were going to invent this story, if you're going to make it up, you would not make up that shepherds were the first to witness this. You would not do that. Shepherds were lowly, they spent time with animals more than with people. They were outdoorsmen. They were not. They were uncouth, uneducated. Even today, we I think we can wonder, why, why shepherds? Well, they're humble. Well, so we're fishermen. So we're laborers. Why shepherds? I find it fascinating, and I think not insignificant, that the birth of the baby who would become the good shepherd was first announced to shepherds. I don't think that's unintentional. The birth of the child who would grow to be the shepherd of his flock, his sheep, the good shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. That his, the news was first announced to just that, 
a group of humble shepherds. Of course, a shepherd with sheep is the primary image the Bible gives us of how God relates to his people. I'll put it this way. The presence of Emmanuel is like a shepherd with his sheep. If we're asking the question, what's the presence of Emmanuel? What does it mean to have God with us? One of the primary images, probably the primary image from Old to New Testament of how God relates to his people is shepherd and sheep. It's all over the pages. Psalm 75, 78, 52. Then he led out his people like a sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Psalm 95, verse 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And Psalm 100, verse 3. Know the Lord, for he is God. It's he who made us. We are his, his people, the sheep of his pasture. Over and over again, we're told that God is with us like a shepherd is with sheep. We see an image here of a shepherd leading his sheep. This is not one that I took in Israel, but I saw many, many scenes like this in and around Bethlehem, the place of shepherds. Still today, on the hillsides around Bethlehem, you'll see Bedouin shepherds walking with flocks. The relationship of a shepherd with sheep is utterly unique in an agrarian society. It's not like raising uh, even goats, cattle, or any other livestock. Shepherds know their sheep in a way that, that no other tender of flocks knows their herds or flocks. There's an intimacy. Douglas McMillan wrote a book called The Lord, Our Shepherd, uh, as well as Philip Keller, called, a book called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. Both of those books give us an inside look into this relationship. McMillan says, he tells a story of his good friend who was a shepherd. And this is not in the Middle East, but this is in Ireland, nevertheless, or in England, excuse me. Nevertheless, he said he sell, this, his friend sold three lambs to a neighboring shepherd, farmer. And then weeks later... From another hillside, across a road, he's looking at that flock of his friend who he sold the lambs to. He says, look, there are my three old lambs. He could pick them out from a hillside across the road. Because he knew them. Intimately knew them. That's hard for me to get my head around. Sheep or sheep. Just a massive, woolly, you know, nuisance. There's no place in Scripture that better expresses how the shepherd loves his sheep than Psalm 23. The shepherd's psalm written by David, the shepherd king. So again, if you have your Bible turned there, we'll read the psalm. As a matter of fact, just for fun, let's read this psalm together as it's printed on the, and is on the screen. You ready? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's good, it's, it's good to read that and to hear you read it with me. There are some interesting and striking parallels between the shepherd Psalm 23 and what we just read in Luke chapter 2. Now we could spend weeks and weeks unpacking all of this, but I just want to look at three aspects of the way that Emmanuel is with us like a shepherd with his sheep, which are connecting Psalm 23 and Luke chapter 2. We're going to examine just three of those. But first, let me point out before we do that while the name Emmanuel, God with us, is nice and, and cozy and warm, fuzzy feelings at Christmas time, we should keep in mind that it's actually not a compliment to us that we're called sheep with a shepherd. I don't know if you ever thought about that. Calling God our good shepherd and us his sheep is not exactly appraising us. It's saying you're like sheep. Sheep, if you've ever been around them, are really quite pitiful smelly and helpless, much like most of you <laughs> and me. They are totally dependent on their shepherd. They require constant care. You can't leave them alone. You can let cattle graze. You have to attend, you have to attend sheep constantly. In Matthew 9, verse 36, Jesus, we're told, he looks out at the crowds in, around Jerusalem, and he sees them, and he says, they are harassed and helpless like what? Sheep without a shepherd. There was no more desperate 
uh, condition to the Eastern mind than a shepherdless sheep. You're in real trouble if that's if you're a sheep without a shepherd. First thing I want you to see is the presence of Emmanuel removes fear. The presence of Emmanuel removes fear. See an image here that of a shepherd watching a sheep. This is one I did actually take when we were in Israel. They look rather content there. We, we pulled over uh, at, on the roadside. I just, I just ran over to the fence and took this picture from the road near Bethlehem. An olive tree in the background, that's a Bedouin shepherd. It removes fear. Notice the first words spoken by the angel to the shepherds in Luke 2, verse 10. What's the first thing the angel says? Fear not. Which, by the way, is the first words the angel Gabriel speaks to Mary, and the first word the angel speaks to Joseph, and all throughout the Bible, angels show up, and the first thing they say is, fear not. Why do they say that? Because angels are not cute babies with wings. Angels are not, oh, look at your little angel, you know. Angels are terrifying. Why? Because they reflect something of the holiness and the glory of God, which when you come close enough to it, it causes you to realize how, how unworthy and unholy you are. It causes you to quake and to tremble. In the Old Testament, you fall down flat on your face. What does Isaiah say in Isaiah 6 when he sees the winged creatures flying around the throne room? Oh, look how cute, he says. No. He says, go away, right? Woe to me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Fear not, the angel says to these shepherds. And what do we read in Psalm 23, verse 4? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Why not? Answer, for you are with me. For God, my shepherd, is with me. You know what happens to sheep when they get lost? They panic. They go in, get into deeper trouble. They, they run like crazy. They get all stressed out and anxiety, and they die. Other animals don't do this. Horses will often find their way home by instinct or sometimes become like a wild herd. In fact, when my wife and I, over Fourth of July weekend, we're, we're in the outer banks of North Carolina with a family, and we visited the wild horses of Corolla. Some of you have, may have been there and seen these. These are descendants of colo the colonial Spanish horses. They've been there for centuries, roaming the beaches. There's about 100 to 150 of them left. There used to be thousands. But they're descendants of these horses that the Spanish wrecked their ships on the reefs, and they, didn't, they, they threw the things overboard that would wash the shore, including the horses. And those horses that they tossed overboard swam to shore. And the descendants still roam the beaches today. In other words, they got lost, some of them. They weren't able to collect all of them. And those horses became a wild pack, a herd of horses. You can see them running up and down the beaches. Have you ever heard of a wild herd of sheep in the frontier? <laughs> Do you read about the cowboy, the frontier days? Watch out for the wild sheep roaming the hillsides. No. They don't do well on their own. They die. And we're called sheep without a shepherd. Sheep, like humans, are naturally anxious and fearful creatures. They cannot take care of themselves spiritually. The, su the simple truth is that sheep, of all the animals, are t far too slow and too stupid and too weak to fend for themselves. And we are the sheep of his pasture. It sounds, when you read it, without thinking about it, it sounds so nice, doesn't it? Oh, the sheep, a little lambing. You are too slow and stupid and weak to fend for yourself spiritually. You need a shepherd. I'm not trying to be funny, although it is sort of humorous. I'm trying to tell you the truth. The presence of God with us, Emmanuel, is like a she shepherd with his sheep. Weak, helpless creatures who wander off and die without him. This is offensive to contemporary ears, I admit. We don't like to think of ourselves as weak and helpless and foolish and dumb. We'd much rather think that, yes, I have my life together for the most part, but I could use some help, and if Jesus could come alongside of me and aid me in my life, that would be great. If he could help me with my agenda. That's not what we're told. God is present with you as Emmanuel, not on your terms, but on his. And his terms are, you're the sheep. I'm the shepherd. And you really can't relate to me unless you get that right. If you think you're in charge and I'm there to help you, then I'm not with you. It's not Emmanuel. That's some concoction of your own mind. When you recognize that though I may have been a success in business, though the rest of my family might think I'm a big deal, though I might be a pastor of a church, 
The truth is, in God's economy, I'm not much more than a little sheep. I'm in desperate need of a shepherd. That's how he relates to us. And there really isn't another way. Last night, as I mentioned, there was a baptism service. And it was a privilege to baptize some folks and see, hear that. I just love hearing stories. Sometimes, in fact, every time I, we do baptism class, everyone's always nervous to get baptized, not so much because of the water, but because they're afraid to speak in front of people. Perhaps you can relate. The, 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 the statistics still say the number one fear is public speaking. Number two is death, which seems odd to me. Jerry Seinfeld says, so if you're at, at a funeral, you'd rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. <laughs> according to those statistics. They're just nervous to share in front of people. And I always tell them, you have no idea how many times I've heard people say, that, your, that person's story helped change my life. God used it. Who out there needs to hear your story? So last night there was a woman, an older woman, and her daughter were both getting baptized. And she shared the story of how she was told by her own mother many, many years ago that she never wanted her. She said it, that, that her birth ruined her life. She said, I looked for uh, belonging and significance in the arms of men that mistreated me. She treated me like trash. She said, my whole life I felt fearful and alone until I met Jesus. And she's in her 70s. To hear her say that, my whole life I felt fearful and alone until I met my good shepherd. She was quite literally a sheep without a shepherd, right? Lost and wandering. So the presence of Emmanuel removes fear. Second, the presence of Emmanuel brings peace. This falls right on the heels of removing fear. Do you know there's such a thing as, uh, uh, there's such a term as sheep worrying? How many of you ever heard of this term, sheep worrying? Anybody ever heard of it? It's a real thing. You can look it up. Google even says so. Sheep worrying. You know what sheep worrying is? It's when groups of sheep get stressed out because they're being chased by stray dogs or neighbor's dogs or even wolves. They're not bitten or attacked but they get so full of anxiety and fear they die because they're stressed. Sheep worrying. In fact, in England and in Ireland, it's legal for a shepherd to shoot your dog if it wanders onto his property and worries the sheep. So keep your dog on a leash if you go visit England. I read an article about 116 sheep that dropped dead because they were were worried (laughs) by these uh, stray dogs. It's only in the presence of the shepherd that peace comes. In fact, Philip Keller in his book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, says, only when the shepherd comes, when the sheep are lost and worried and stressed, they're, they're going to worry themselves to death. They're going to run around in circles and, and, until they die of anxiety, unless the shepherd finds them and sometimes actually physically restrains them, grabs them, holds them down. Does that remind you of anything in the Psalms? He makes me lie down in green pastures. You'll see an image of a sh- shepherd carrying sheep here. I like it because I don't know if you can see the sheep's face. <laughs> looks hilarious to me. looks stupid and lost and funny. And the shepherd has a hold of him. Let's read Luke 2, verse 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he's pleased. And then Psalm 23, verses 2 and 3. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me to paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The parallel point here is that it's the presence of the shepherd that brings peace. Peace is not just the absence of stress. We think of peace as the absence of conflict, the absence of trouble, the absence of pain. If I could just have this removed, I'd have peace. That's actually not true, the Bible says. Removing all your difficulties doesn't bring you peace. It's the presence of your shepherd, of Emmanuel, in the midst of your trouble that brings real peace. And there's a big difference. We tend to, don't we, focus on, if I could just get out of this. How many of you haven't prayed those prayers? Help me out of this, Lord, and I promise I'll do better. If you could help me here, if you could remove this conflict, if you could get me this job, if you could bring this issue to a resolution, if you could heal my friend or my family member, if you could just fix this situation, then I'd have peace. But real peace is not circumstantial. Real peace is the presence of God regardless of your circumstances. We see it in the image of sheep, right? 
It's not until the shepherd comes. They might actually be safe. In fact, it's true, Philip Keller says, sometimes they'll be in a safe meadow, but because they're lost and not with the shepherd, they will seriously just run around until the shepherd finds them, grabs them, and forces them to rest, bringing peace. You ever felt God do that for you? You ever felt God force you to lie down, spiritually speaking, force you to be still? Force you, did ever God speak to you what Jesus spoke when he was in the boat tossed by the storm and his disciples heard him say to the wind and waves, peace, be still. Have you heard him say that to you, to your soul? Be still. Settle down. I'm with you. I'm present. Philip Keller, as I mentioned in his book, The Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, says not only do sheep get lost and, and, and very easy, and not only does the shepherd have to grab them and hold them down, but he has to bring them back physically sometimes to the flock. Now, you know, all this talk, actually, when I was thinking about this, about shepherds and sheep, about how helpless they are, how weak they are, how smelly they are, how foolish they are, made me think, I don't know if I want to be a shepherd. You thought about that? I don't know that I would want that calling. And it made me think, are sheep really worth it? I mean, if you're given the choice, wouldn't you raise, rather raise something else? Pigs are kind of smelly, maybe cattle. What, what would you rather raise? Sheep seem like a lot of work. Is it worth it? The answer, from the Bible's perspective, is a resounding yes. Not only are sheep the most helpless, but they're also the most valuable of all the livestock. A shepherd in the ancient world, his wealth, his money wasn't in an ATM, wasn't in a bank, bank account or an investment strategy. And he like had this wealth and he decided, well, I'm going to take my money and buy some sheep because I want to be a shepherd. His, his sheep were his wealth. His treasure was his sheep. This is my wealth. This is my livelihood. These are my treasures. I treat them as if they're my children. Do you see an image there of how God loves his sheep? We are his treasure. He is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. How do you tell the value of something? I've shared this before. I love this little analogy. I used to love, it's not on much anymore. Is the antique road show still on? Anybody know? Is it? I, I need to find out what channel that's on. I used to love to watch that. One of the reasons I like to watch it is because there's always people with ridiculous junk that's worthless who think it's valuable. And then the guy tells him, oh, that's a copy and it's not worth anything. And you can see their face all disappointed. I, I get a kick out of that for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> but even better is when somebody brings something, they don't know what it is. I've got it at a garage sale. And they, like, they, they find out it's worth thousands of dollars. How does that expert, you know, and that little number comes up across the screen, right? $10,000. How do they know what it's worth? How does the expert know what this painting or this picture or whatever it is that it's worth? How do they know? They have enough knowledge in the field that they know the price somebody, a collector, is willing to pay for it, right? They know the price someone's willing to pay. That's how you get a value. I saw that same piece go for this much. I know someone's willing to pay that. How do you know the value of a human being, a human life? How do you know what you're worth? Our culture is giving you all kinds of ways to try to estimate your worth, your net worth, what people think of you, your reputation, your education, your achievement. Scripture says... There's one way, only one way you know how valuable you are. It's the price your shepherd was willing to pay. That's how you know how precious you are to him. Is it worth it? If we're sheep and we're wandering and helpless and stubborn and God is our shepherd, is it worth it? And he says, yeah. Look at the cross if you want to know if it's worth it. If you want to know if I think you're worth it, look at the cross. This is the last point. The presence of Emmanuel brings joy. The presence of Emmanuel brings joy. Can't have a good sermon without a C.S. Lewis quote. Well, you can, but it helps. So let me give you this one from Mere Christianity, which is so good. I've thought about this many times, and it fits here. He says, God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn and to feed on. There is no other. That is why it is just no good asking God to make us happy in our own way without bothering about religion or about him. God cannot give us joy and peace apart from himself because there is no such thing. I love that. 
It's no good bothering asking God for peace and joy and comfort apart from himself. He can't give you that. Why? Because it doesn't exist. The only way you get the things God wants to give is when he gives you himself. The presence of Emmanuel brings joy. Let's read Luke 2, verses 10 through 11. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The good news of great joy is that for all of your sheepness, for all of your stubbornness and foolishness and waywardness and neediness and helplessness, you have a good shepherd who's given his life for you. In fact, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah in chapter 53, it says not only is God our shepherd, the shepherd also becomes the lamb. He says he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. We like sheep have gone astray, right? But he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Like a sheep before its shearers, he is silent. So he opened not his mouth, Isaiah tells us. And when John the Baptist sees Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 29, what's the first thing John the Baptist says? Yes, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I think it's no accident that the announcement of the birth of Christ was first made outside of Mary and Joseph to shepherds. Because that's the primary way God's with us. We're his sheep, the flock under his care. Our shepherd became our sacrificial lamb so that we might become his sheep. I'm going to read to you a poem that I used to read to my kids when they were young. It's the poem by William Blake called The Lamb. Some of you will know it. And I don't think I pondered the, the depth of this poem from Scripture until re- thinking about this sermon. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream or o'er the mead. Gave thee clothing of delight softest clothing, woolly bright, gave thee such a tender voice, making all the vales rejoice. Little lamb who made thee, dost thou know who made thee? Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. I, a child, and thou, a lamb, We are called by his name, little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. Let's pray. Father God, we live in a world where we're striving to prove ourselves every day. And your word frees us from that because it tells us the truth. That in our hearts, we're not much more than sheep. We're helpless, and we're scattered, and we're wayward. And we are in desperate need of a shepherd to guide us. We thank you and praise you that you, Emmanuel, are like us as a shepherd is with his sheep. That's how you're with us. Help us to surrender under your care and to follow you. We praise you and we thank you. Lord Jesus, our good shepherd and our Emmanuel. Amen. Kind of sheds a new light on that song, doesn't it? If you're here this morning and you'd like someone to pray with you or meet with you for prayer, please feel free to come forward at the close of the service. And let me remind you, I forgot to say this earlier, but we received the benevolent offering on the first of the month. So if you came prepared to give to that, that money goes to meet the needs of people in our church family, in our community who are hurting. So thank you in advance for your, your generosity. Now, brothers and sisters, little sheep, go in the grace of your good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is your Emmanuel. Amen. And go in peace.